Council will go ahead and call to order, please. Mr. Mason. Emmons. Here. OJ. Here. Murray. Here. Brown. Here. Klein. Short. Here. Mayor Box. Here. Item number one, a general business is a training session by Mr. David Weatherford and Mr. Bill Tackett from the Oklahoma Municipal Assurance Group, or OMAG. Good afternoon, gentlemen, and welcome. Mayor, thanks for having us. So we appreciate uh, being back in Jinx and um, opportunity to bring uh, the training together. My name is Bill Tackett. And for those of you that uh, are new or for some reason didn't remember everything I said last time I was here, um, OMAG is your insurance provider. However, we are not a private insurance company. We're formed under the Oklahoma Statute Title 74, which is the Interlocal Cooperative Cooperation Act. And it's a very simple law. It says whatever Jinx can lawfully do by itself, you can find a partner and do it with them. June 1st of 1977, Choctaw in the village, a couple of suburbs of Oklahoma City, signed the interlocal agreement, and from those two towns, we have 500 cities and towns that belong to us and have had for decades. So we operate only within the confines of the state of Oklahoma. And we provide uh, insurance products. We are technically a public entity risk pool. But because we're a Title 74 interlocal, um, we're not required to pay dividends to uh, folks back east or those kinds of things. So we have developed over many years uh, different kinds of uh, grants, scholarships, and uh, programs that we think address our loss exposures and um, help mitigate our loss um, payments that we have to make. Um, we partnered with David Weatherford many, many years ago, and in 2017, uh, the training program that we provide now is, is how we came about. So um, David Weatherford's been our partner in providing this training for governing body officials for many years. Uh, we've done this training in about 200 cities and towns. Um, and uh, the, the test that you'll take today is the same test you all took before. Over a 1,000 people have taken that test, and um, we think it has a lot of validity. David is a longtime city attorney. He became a city attorney after he uh, graduated from the University of Tulsa. He was a city attorney for Coweta for a number of years, 28 years, I believe. Currently city attorney for Mounds and Manford, Arcoma, and Sand Springs, Oklahoma. And we're very pleased to be able to uh, provide this training for you all in this partnership with David. little bit different and uh, talk through what we're trying to accomplish. Good to see all of you again. Good to be in Jinx. As Bill said, we've been to lots of different cities and it is unusual to come to Jinx because you have such a history of success. Uh, we unfortunately get invited to a lot of cities and towns who don't have that. And I'm always curious whether cities recognize when they're successful. And one of the reasons for developing this test and this training program is to help us do that, to help us understand what our job is, what our role is. Uh, when we originally started, we wanted to improve the meeting process. As you may or may not realize, in some places, meetings are very difficult. Uh, compliance with the Open Meeting Act is a problem in some cities, unfortunately. And we really have had the idea that we could help make it better because if we avoid some of those traps that are out there, if we make our, our meetings more business-like, uh, it will be better for you and more elected officials will enjoy their service and stay with it longer and we'll have less turnover. And in the end, we'll have more stable cities. So that's been kind of the goal of what we were trying to accomplish. Uh, as Bill mentioned, as a part of that, we, we have a test that is intended to measure how stable are we as a government, how stable are we as a city, because that should be our goal. Our goal is to be stable in operations so that we don't have those wild swings uh, from good to bad. And so as a part of doing that, as Bill mentioned, we created a test to help evaluate that. The stability test was based on input from a large number of experts, mostly in the Tulsa area, asking the simple question, what should we evaluate to see how we're operating? What areas of operations are important? And so the test is universal. Everyone takes the same thing. We're going to work through it. Uh, and 
I think it helps if we can get your input and get a score of how you think you're doing. And here are some of the results we've seen. I'll give you a warning before we go through it. Most are honest in completing it, but not all. There are some places we go and everyone just writes down a 10 in every category, and we know because we do a little bit of review before we go, we know that's probably not true. Very few usually score above a 90, but a few do. And there are some cities and towns in Oklahoma who have been extremely successful over a long period of time. And really what we're trying to evaluate is how and why does that happen? Some get a failing score. We recently did this test at the clerk's conference in Shangri La and over a hundred city clerks took the test. And the overall average score is right at 60 from a hundred different cities and towns around Oklahoma. That should scare us to death. Many more were below 50 than were above 90. Some were below 20 out of 100. And we've seen test results. We've been on site uh, within the last couple of years in which a city uh, evaluated their operations at about a 10% level. We don't take the test, they do. This is their own self-evaluation and it's in every category in which they're failing. Size of city is irrelevant. Your job is the same whether you're in a city this size and the quality of the elected official has nothing at all to do with the population of those people who happen to live around them. We see great elected officials in some places, other places we don't. So how do we evaluate it? You've got a test scorecard in front of you. We're gonna go through it. Bill's gonna offer input as we go. So I want you to give a score on first, financial stability. And we'll collect the score sheet. And Aubrey, if you want to give some to some of the staff, that helps too. You're going to give a score between 0 and 10. A 10 on this test for financial stability is a city that has a reserve policy and is required to have at least 20% of their general funds set aside in a reserve. Okay? You will be shocked to find there are some cities in Oklahoma that have zero reserves. Uh, is your finance director here? No, he is not. Sometimes we cheat and ask the finance director. And so we'll ask Chris. What score would you give? I would give you a 10. I looked at your audits from both 10 years ago and the most recent on file, and uh, I would be shocked if you get anything less than a 10, and you have a long history of having extremely stable finances. Again, we've been in cities in which they call Bill and say, we can't pay payroll, what do we do? And uh, we say, you pay your insurance premium first. So. <laughs> <laughs> it is first on the test because it's the most important. If a city is not financially stable, everything else gets more difficult. So uh, the good news and the bad news about Jinx for the group of you is you come into a situation with a long history of financial stability and it's like uh, managing the New York Yankees in the 30s. The hard job is keeping it that way. It is a tremendous responsibility to sustain the success over time. Well, David, I want you to know that we've grown our net position by over 100% in the last six years, so. Yeah, that's good. It is important. It is extremely important. And, and it's, not, it's not cheating that he's given us all the answers. <laughs> okay. uh, I bet he's not going to weigh okay. in on some of the others. <laughs> Especially question number two, how stable is the governing body? Chris is going to stay away from this one, uh, <laughs> as he should. I, uh, Teresa will object if he tries to answer. <laughs> uh, high score is we have a, a high level of performance at the council level. We attract good and, and qualified members of our board. If we have vacancies, it is considered an honor to serve on this as a part of this organization, and we try to retain those who, who have served well. There's a long history of good quality service from the elected officials. That would be a high score. A low score is you look around and say, I wish we could throw them all out and start over. And we have been in cities in which everyone sitting in your position wrote down a one because they wish everyone else would go away and they were in charge. But you should evaluate how, as a group, you work. 
how as a, as a group do you function? And it, and it is an important part of what we do, and it's a hard thing to evaluate. But city managers, city attorneys, and city clerks get in trouble when they try to regulate your conduct. It's up to you to police bad actors amongst yourselves. And we see that all the time. And Bill, as a former city manager, we won't put Chris on the spot, but it's one of those traps that city managers fall into, isn't it? Trying to get involved in the council disputes. Yeah, I'm a quarter, former city manager, so that tells you how successful I was. <laughs> <laughs> you know, life doesn't seem fair. Randy Ewing stays somewhere for 30 years and I get fired. I <laughs> don't know how that works, <laughs> really. But uh, you all have to police yourselves and you have to have your own culture and you have to set your own expectations and you have to enforce those. I mean, the city manager won't go any further or faster than the ground he or she, she stands on. And so if you guys have done the work that only you all can do, and we'll talk about that more, but uh, uh, that work includes setting the priorities for the organization. Um, your priorities that you set by either unanimous or majority vote are your grade score, or your grade card, your grade score. and. Uh, Really, if you don't have a grade score, then you don't know if you're passing or failing. You need to have your priorities uh, written down so that the manager knows where to take the organization. Um, and it's unfair to the city manager if he or she doesn't have a scorecard. You know, if you guys have a set of priorities, two or three, four things that you think should be accomplished in the next five, ten years, and everybody has clarity on where we're going and why we're going there. And that's the work that only you all can do. I think we did benefit when uh, Corey became mayor. We had a, a strategic planning retreat and came up with uh, a list of priorities and um, timelines. And so uh, I think we're set to do that again January. Since we most important work, their most important work, mm -hmm. and, and it's got to be a group effort, not seven different individual results. That uh, seven of you say these are our seven different list of priorities. So uh, I suspect you guys have done a, a good job of that historically. And I know I'm not supposed to weigh in, but <laughs> I think. I think we ha we've had really good people. The only the only issue is we have to you know we have these elections and so we we've had a lot of turnover. We continue to get really good people on council that do a really good job, but just the amount of turnover. There's no one on this council that appointed me city manager in uh, 2016, and so uh, that's kind of I think the one issue that we've had is is the um, turnover in councilors. So. Yeah, a continuing issue every place, and, and uh, I know you guys historically have done a really good job with orientation for new board members and, and training, but statewide there just isn't any. Uh, and Bill, how are, how are new board members in most places told how to do their job? Well, they're uh, told how to do their job a little better than I got appointed to the uh, Equalization and Excise Board in my county, so the level of orientation I'm going to describe to you exceeds the amount I got on that deal, but uh, generally here's how it goes on a strict assembly and here's how it goes. There's a lot of incentive to show them that they need to have this is yes, that's no, come up with yes or no. That's generally how orientation goes throughout the state. And it's not only grossly unfair to Rodney because Rodney might have got elected because uh, we're going to shave the bear or we're going to paint the water tire purple, but that's what he's going to get done. One of those two things. And uh, he never had municipal government class in high school because it's not important enough for us to learn about. If you're as old as me and Craig, you probably had a semester worth of Oklahoma history in the eighth grade. <laughs> And you know what you learned there? How many governors got impeached and whether or not Alfalfa Bill Murray went to jail or not. But you've never had one credit on how municipal government functions. And unlike county government and unlike state school government, there's five different forms of municipal government. There's really four, but I count charter as kind of five. My little pinky's not very big. Aldermatic, strong mayor, 
council manager, town. And so, you know, if you get elected because you, you got to paint the water tower purple or because you're one of those people that don't have the capacity to form the word no, so you're on everything all the time, or because uh, you've got time on your hands and you're willing to serve, or just because you're doing it for a community purpose, uh, you still have to have a good, strong orientation program. The best one we've seen, and being in Jinx and doing this training is difficult because we go around the state and we hold up two towns as examples to everybody. We hold up Manford and we hold up Jinx. And we say, if you're doing this like Jinx does it, you're going to win. If you do it like Manford does it, you're going to win. So we're here at the town where we hold up to other cities and towns throughout the state. But if you don't have a strong orientation program, and the best one we've ever seen is the city of Guthrie orientation program, then you're not only cheating Rodney, you're cheating the rest of yourselves. And I'm sure you guys do a good job of that, but it's important to have a council handbook that's an active part of what you all look to because the only permanent thing you're gonna create here is the culture that you build or sustain. And one of these days, the aquarium will spring a leak and it won't be here anymore. But if you have a strong culture, if you're able to sustain the culture, you know, I don't know anything new. Everything I've got is old or stolen or both. And uh, we can't find anybody to write a business book for municipal government. But Simon Sinek is a popular author for business books. and. Three years ago, he wrote a book called The Infinite Game. And in it, he says that uh, we're here for a little while. We pull on the rope. And so everything you all do as a governing body for stability purposes and for achieving the goals is you understand that you're in the process business, not the event business. And you may pull on the rope your entire tenure and not get to the point where the ribbon's cut or the picture's made but you're doing the important work along the way to get to that future state. And, uh, and according to your manager, you guys have done the planning and the goal setting. Most places haven't. Zig Ziglar used to say when he was alive, if you aim at nothing, you hit it every time. You're gonna do one of two things. You're gonna go somewhere on purpose or you're gonna make circles like the children of Israel did in the desert. But 2033 is coming. You're gonna do one of two things. And you all are the only ones in the community that get to vote with your opinion. Everybody in the community gets an opinion. You all are the ones that vote and say, Mr. Manager, take us here. You have three jobs that you're supposed to do. You're supposed to set a strategic direction for the organization. You're supposed to monitor results. And you're supposed to adapt policies and uh, encourage the culture that helps sustain the staff as they take you to that future state. And a lot of places, board members don't know what their job is either. No, and uh, if, the, if, the, if the clerk or the attorney or the manager is in the business of helping you uh, with your fussing between yourselves or between the community and you all or whatever, then they're going to have to find an attorney to go around the state and say that they used to be a city manager. So you don't <laughs> want to do that. So you guys have a responsibility, even though you're volunteers, you have other full-time activities, um, that uh, as a group, you all are a board of directors of this municipal corporation. And in order to be the function as a board of directors, two things have to be in place. Number one, your clerk has posted an agenda that meets the open meeting law requirements, and number two, you have a quorum. And those two things are in place. You're functioning as the board of directors of this municipal organization. And you have the duties of care, obedience, and loyalty, just like the board of directors of Walmart will do. You have the duty of care. It means when staff prepares your agenda packet, you read it, you ask your questions in advance, you're prepared when the back of your lap hits the top of your chair to discuss or vote, you're ready to go. The duty of obedience is you'll do whatever the previous ordinances or resolutions by the city of Jinx exist until you amend them, make new ones, do away with them, which is in your, your power and authority to do. 
We'll do whatever the state and the federalities say we're going to do, as much as we can put up with. That's the duties of care and obedience. The duty of loyalty means that your hat, your ball cap says jinx on it. It doesn't say high school football coach thinks or donut shop brain shop brains trust wants. It's going to school teacher said. It's what's best for the entire organization. And so you have the duties of care, obedience, and loyalty. You have the resources of time, money, and people. I often say, uh, because it's easy to say, that you think your most scarce resource is money. I can't say that here in Jinx. <laughs> but your most scarce resource is time. And so you all should only ever have four things on your agenda. And I'm sure you do. Like I said 10 minutes ago, it's tough to do this training here. You all do things very, very well. <coughs> But you should only ever have four things on your agenda. Number one, the future. If it's not on your agenda, you can't talk about it or vote on it. How does Sand Springs talk about the future? We have quarterly meetings uh, four times a year to talk about long-range planning. And we usually pick one of the stability topics, such as public image. What can we do to improve the public image? And that's a, an hour and a half meeting in which council is able to express thoughts and opinions on where do we want to go with this topic? How do we want to get better? Not with the idea of voting on anything, but to have a good discussion about it. It, it really becomes the four times a year you get to express yourself on a specific topic and have real discussion about it as opposed to be bound by an agenda topic where you're voting on a specific thing and shouldn't deviate from that and you're very regimented in a business meeting. So that, that's a good way that's worked there very well. Some cities do it a once a year thing, that's fine. <coughs> uh, sometimes it's hard to get everyone to focus a four, a four hour or six hours on a once a year. Uh, for Sand Springs, that's worked well for us to do hour and a half, four times a year. Yeah, we normally- on Most don't do any. Yeah, normally when David and I go around the state, we see two things on agendas yesterday and today. We never see tomorrow. So having the future on your agenda is important. You guys do that. Um, uh, the second thing should be on your agenda is our col culture dash policies. Y'all are mature organizations, shouldn't be much of that left to do. The third thing is monitoring results and I did a spreadsheet one time, I went through and read a year's worth of agendas for a lot of towns. It was like reading the phone book, but I did it for you. And I put them in categories and the most successful towns that we found spend most of their time monitoring results and doing the things that only the governing body can do. So that's three of the four. What's the fourth one? The fourth one is decisions that exceed the authority granted. So Chris, what is your spending authority? If it's not in the budget. Yeah. So if something is $25,010, it has to be on your agenda if it's not in the budget because he, you, because you all have a group have not delegated more authority to him than that. And so generally what we suggest is uh, the authority that's been delegated has been uh, truncated because trust is low. That's typically what's going on because there's churn on the governing body, churn in the manager's office, that kind of thing. If something is, not policy, it smells administrative, but you haven't delegated that much authority, and put it on the consent agenda. And keep your most precious resource, which is time, clear as, of many, as, a, clear of as many administrative things as possible, because you have an administrative staff, obviously very professional and capable. I'm not here to tell you what your delegation of authority should be, what is it in uh, Sand Springs? Went from 25 to 50. Is what is it in Manfred? 100,000. Is there a rule of thumb? Is it relative to revenue so. or? We've seen everything you, uh, we went to a city, a county seat city in which we were met at the door by a council person who wanted us to convince them to change their spending authority because it was excessive and it was 1,500 bucks. And uh, I had that response and said, no, we're not gonna convince you it's excessive. It's whatever is comfortable with you uh, if it is in the budget, for example, if you have a new police car in the budget, do you have to bring it back for a council vote to buy it? No. Um, that's a good way to do it. You've made that decision to buy X number of police cars this year. You don't need to vote again and again and again. 
we see in some cities, even if they've budgeted it, they still put it on the agenda, they debate it, and they spend all their time doing administrative things. So that's, that's a, yours is a good, very good way to do it. Yeah, that's what I inherited from what we, you know. Uh, <coughs> Manford's is high for the competitive bidding amount for whatever reason, so when it went to 100,000, theirs went to 100,000, their, their town board is comfortable with that and has not changed it. So they, they were aware when a competitive bidding went from 50 to 100 that spending authority would increase. It keeps them out of administrative things. They, it, they don't have the distinction between budgeted and not budgeted. So there's not, there's not a right or wrong answer. Yeah, I will say that those two examples, uh, I pull them out because David's the city attorney for those two communities. They spend most of their time monitoring results. So, the lower, yeah, the lower it is, the more you're going to spend on daily administrative things. I mean, that's, I mean if, if, if you push authority down as far as it'll go, you want to pull information up as high as you can get it because information is the currency of decision making. If you think of a triangle, there's a lot of information down here that never makes it to the point. You guys are the point of the triangle. Not all that information needs to make the trip. A lot of it gets handled below y'all's level, and that's appropriate. Which leads to what I usually say every place I go to board members, because I get to leave town, some things are none of your business. And that's hard to accept by some board members. We've heard that repeatedly. We we've, uh, say the same thing every place we go, but we've had board members say, no, I'm a, I'm a city official 24-7. I have a right to know everything, including every personnel decision, every, it's not true. It's not, some things are none of your business. Some things are not Teresa's business. Some things are not the manager's business. Most are. But there are limits to your authority. You have an extremely important but limited role, as we all do. Extremely important but limited. And really, the most important thing you do is figure out what you want Jinx to be. And all of you have inherited a city where those who came before you did a very good job of that, which means it's important to keep doing it well. Yeah, so I think a long time ago, when I was tying my dinosaur up at Oki State, they said that uh, politics is who gets what when. And you all practice politics in this form of government when you make a budget or when you approve budget amendments. You are allocating resources and you're deciding who gets what when. And it goes to the care, obedience, and loyalty. Your loyalty is to the entire organization. So uh, usually at this point in the, in the play that David and I put on, I say that I live over here in the used to be better subdivision. It used to be better. All of Jinx's subdivisions are above average, so I can't say that. But I used to live, I used to live over here in the used to be better subdivision. And my road is janky. And I'm, I work a job and I'm tired every Friday and so I call Matthew up and I say, hey, fix my road every Friday. And if you don't answer, I keep calling. I don't care how late it is. Because the later it gets, the more liquid courage I have. And I'm going to talk to my city council person. I'm tired of this janky road. Well, the road that goes to the grocery store that makes all your sales tax got all your street money this year. Or the outlet mall. Or the outlet mall. <laughs> it's a grocery store, David. Don't get me confused. This is why we don't do this together right now. <laughs> and so the only thing you're going to be able to do is call the manager and say, can we put some coal patch or some gravel in there? And then you're going to tell me that you're going to fight to the very end that in fiscal year 24-25, I'm going to get my road fixed. But this year, you had to fix the road to the outlet mall and the Gucci store because they make the sales tax, and we run off sales tax. And so that's when you practice politics, and it's in light of loyalty, what's best for the entire organization. It's not best for you because you're in my part of town, and I'm going to call you and wear you out every Friday. But you have to put up with that because it's what's best for the entire organization. We had to get the road to the Gucci shop fixed so we get the sales tax because it's what's best for the entire organization. We're not Chicago. We don't have wards and ward healers and... You know, the, the way this form of government came about was because the progressives and the 
federal government in the 1800s were tired of Jacksonian patronage. They wanted people to serve based on merit, and that evolved into the city manager, city county manager form of government over 100 years ago where you all are the board of directors, you hire a CEO, he has vice presidents that have names like police chief and planning director, and instead of shareholders, we have stakeholders. And they expect government to run like a business in this form of government, based on merit, not based on patronage, not based on the fact that, John, I'm telling you, your uncle never voted for me, so that street can go square too, because you're not getting no street. You get your uncle straight, and then we'll see about your street. That's not the way it works here. But when you allocate resources, you do it in the light of your duty of so, about sir, real, real quick. So, Chris, just to be clear, sorry, your authority hasn't changed in the eight years you've been here. Okay. Was okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and that's a good policy thing for the group of you to figure out what you want it to be working with your staff. And a uh, couple things I'll mention on your job, and, and I think we do a poor job of, of covering this. Uh, I had a council member just within the last couple weeks say, boy, I didn't know I would get criticized when I took this job. And my immediate response was, uh, <laughs> uh, why don't you go work in customer service for an hour? <laughs> because... It is going to be a part of the territory, unfortunately. We're in an era in which criticism of public officials and public employees is continuous. So I would mention that just so you know. You won't be surprised by that. You also should not be surprised, though. City employees take the brunt of it, and especially customer service. It is a continuous, everyday thing. And if you were to go work, talk with those employees, you would, you would hear. It is amazing the names they're called the way they're treated, and it is continuous. And it's a real problem in what we try to do. Second thing I would mention is over the years, we've asked uh, elected officials to give us some input about their job. And one question I've asked is the most difficult decision you have to make as an elected official. And this is from a survey of those who have served just like you, and it is overwhelmingly land use. Has been, and it's gotten worse. But that is overwhelmingly the most difficult decision you will face is land use. And I assume that's probably been true for you. I think it's true every place. <laughs> Third question on the test is how are your meetings? Uh, I think I mentioned when we started this training, we were trying to attack the meeting process because my worst experience as a city attorney was dealing with meetings that were out of control and difficult. I'm sure you haven't had that problem, but a high score on the test would be you absolutely enjoy coming to city council meetings. Don't count this one. Uh, you enjoy the work you do. You look forward to attending them. Low score is they're miserable, and I hope I never go to another one. Uh, I've seen everything you can imagine over attending the several thousand, over 2,000 city council meetings from fights amongst council members to name-calling, to arguments, everything you can imagine. Uh, I had a city attorney call me recently for a good-sized city in the Oklahoma City area. He's new at that city, and he said, I don't know what to do. They violated the Open Meeting Act repeatedly during the meeting. And I don't know how to handle this, because they have a culture of violating the Open Meeting Act. They don't stick with the agenda topic. They ran <coughs> randomly... Uh, Talk about whatever they want to talk about. I like to tell the story that my very first experience as a city attorney was in Coweta, and my first week, the mayor called and said, I've got a meeting next week. I don't know if you need to be there or not, but I thought I should at least tell you. And I said, okay, who are you meeting with? And he said, I don't remember his name. It just says OSBI at the end of it. And I said, why does he want to talk to you? And he said, I don't know, something about some meeting law I've never heard of. And some of this training comes as a result of that. How, what a disservice to the elected officials that they don't know about the Open Meeting Act. Uh, that was the last time in 28 years we had an allegation of an open meeting violation in Kuwaita because we should take it seriously. 
We should stick with the agenda. We should have business meetings. And a violation is criminal for you and not me. So we have restrictions on what we do. And we're, we are the most regulated industry in the world. And you are very strictly regulated with the Open Meeting Act. And, and I know, and Jinks, you guys know about that. You rely on your attorney. Teresa's dealt with these issues for years on Open Meeting Acts. But we can't get lax. One mistake will haunt you. It takes years to get over it. Uh, strictly comply. Go above and beyond. Be careful with how you behave. Be careful with what a quorum is. We're working on different training things that we're going to try to get out, uh, how to do things so that we avoid problems because it's difficult. Chris, any, any meeting issues that come up? The only thing I would bring up uh, is it's not just the Open Meeting Act. It's, you know, if we are making decisions um, that, you know, there's people that may like the decision, there's people that may not like the decision. And so whatever you say during a meeting can be used against you in a lawsuit. And so, I mean, we have um, uh, uh, numerous lawsuits um, related to land use, but we have one that's from years back that I don't even know uh, if many people up here today were even on council at the time. But, you know, the, the lawsuit specifically has um, calls out statements made by council members. Um, and so I think, you know, just being careful with, with the words and what we say while we're um, at these meetings is really important too because, again, they can be, the words we say here can be used uh, against us later. Yeah, yeah. Uh, near relative to the open meeting laws, the Open Records Act, and so you all are in the Tulsa area and you probably know this, but uh, I think uh, people sitting on the Tulsa City Council uh, were texting each other and found out that their phones contained open records. And so, um, <laughs> yeah, city turned them over. They didn't dispute that at all. They knew they had to. There, there are some attorneys on uh, citizen sides who are making the argument that anytime a city employee is on the payroll, Anything they do on a personal device is a public record. Okay. Anything they do on a city device obviously is. But some are arguing that if you are on the payroll and you have your personal cell phone and you do a Google search, that's a public record because you're getting paid a salary while you're doing that. Now, that hasn't been answered in court yet, but there are some trying to push this to the limit. And really the point is you've got to be very careful to protect yourself. Uh, everyone else can't protect you. You've got to protect yourself. Be careful. I think Tulsa learned that lesson the hard way, but the city of Tulsa did not dispute that those were public records because there were texts. Well, and I think the issue was that it was during a public meeting yeah, and there was discussion about a policy decision in that do, we, do they spend money on Gilcrete or do they spend it on something else? Yeah. And so in the public meeting, they were privately going back and forth discussing that policy issue and one of the counselor's um, recommendations for that specific issue. So, right, it was related to that topic. And, and, and part of the allegation is by having a private text, you're circumventing the Open Meeting Act delivery yeah. process by, by having private discussions. No different than if two of you whispered to each other during a public hearing, uh, you really are circumventing what's supposed to be happening. Just have to be careful with the appearance of that, and, and it's hard, isn't it? How do you guys feel about us using iPads? Um, does every has everybody been issued one mm -hmm. about using iPad, iPads that the city has issued us during council meetings? I don't see any problem with it. It's it's common practice. Uh, I mean, but obviously, at, at any point, somebody could say, "I want to know what Kevin's looking at." I think so. Okay. I think you should, as long as you know what the rules are, yeah. uh, be careful with it. Uh, be careful texting the person next to you and saying, boy, that I don't like that argument from that person. Mm. But what Chris said, it may be used against you later. It's not just the city of Tulsa. One of the top five or six largest cities in the state, um, there was a person in another location that was texting uh, 
members around the horseshoe during the meeting and they were coordinating how they were going to argue and vote. Um, so it's not just Tulsa. And, you know, these are extreme examples. We understand that. But um, we, as you all are aware, we live in a, a political environment nowadays that what happens at the federal and the state level happens to you all because you all are the ones they can get a hold of. So some of that discord that we see in our culture reaches the local level first, unfortunately, because you all are the most accessible. Next topic is employees. It's hard in a city this size to rate the workforce, but uh, in evaluating how stable a city is, we should ask how, how stable is the workforce. A high score is we attract and retain good people. It's considered a good place to work. We provide good pay and benefits. It's an honor to work for the city of Jinx. That should be our goal as a board of directors for the organization. Low score is that city that just has constant turnover, can't hire anyone, can't retain anyone. And as a policy making board, you get to dictate some of that by setting the budget and, and how you uh, allocate resources for the workforce. It is interesting that we're in an era in which uh, it's much more difficult to work for a city. And it shouldn't be that way. It, uh, if we think about how we want to build a culture in a city that's successful, we should want to retain and, and keep the best possible talent we can. So give a score on it. Number five is public image. What does the public as a whole think of the city of Jinx as an organization? A high score would be a city in which uh, there's a lot of public confidence in the decisions that are made. You're considered a leader in the region. There's a history of making good decisions for the for the city, low score is that city that just has zero public confidence. We usually see it with packed meetings. A lot of cities have a culture of having meetings that are just completely overcrowded for years, and they never get out of that. Uh, what does the public expect from us and expect from you? I think they expect competence first. Do your job well. and. I think if you do that, you'll be successful. So public image is a hard one. We know statewide this is the lowest score that we see. It just is. Uh, just an easier score than Jinx, like most of these. It just is. But a lot of places, it's a very difficult issue. Number six is crisis management. How well prepared are you for a disaster? Government exists to deal with those things that go wrong. A well, high score is a city that has made arrangements for what to do when a disaster happens. How much spending authority does the manager have if there's a tornado, for example? Uh, is public safety prepared and ready? The public expects us to be ready when there's a disaster and an emergency and expects you to be ready to deal with it. I heard an interesting comment from one of our largest cities a few years ago that they had to have an emergency council meeting to approve repairs to a water line because the manager didn't have the authority to fix a water line. A uh, major water line, city was going to be completely out of water. Well, we know a water line is probably going to break in Jinx someday. Uh, <laughs> hopefully your manager has the authority to deal with a disaster if one occurs and is not hampered by a $25,000 spending limit. Because most of the time during an disaster, and Craig would know this from your experience, you don't have time to get a big group of people together to have a meeting to decide what to do. You really need to be prepared to deal with it. So this question is asking, how well prepared are you to deal with those situations? Because that's at the core of what government does. Sometimes when we come to this question on the stability test, uh, because I'm blessed with the ability to read minds, not just body language, uh, I hear people saying, well, uh, you're taking all of our authority away from us and you're giving it all to the administrative people. And that's not really the point. The point is the timing of decisions. So Mike Nunley used to say only God can make it rain and only the core can make it flood. And so they knew in Sand Springs that the sewer plant was going underwater every three and a half years. And so the city council in Sand Springs decided way back here that when the sewer plant goes underwater, the manager has all the authority up to the entire total budget to get the sewer plant back in place. And they 
made that decision back here because they already made the policy decision that we're going to treat the poo water before it goes back in the river. That's our policy decision. We're going to treat the wastewater. Now, how we're going to do it, we're going to do it with a mechanical plant in Sand Springs. And so since we've made those two decisions, now we're going to decide way back here in advance of the disaster to give them enough authority in those events to take care of the situation. It doesn't remove any of y'all's uh, authority or responsibility. And remember, we always say push authority down as far as you can make it go, but the corollary to that is you can never delegate authority or responsibility. You can only delegate authority. And that's why you have to monitor results. So if the manager in Sand Springs has one of those type of events, then there's a robust report that follows, and sometimes there's even council action subsequent to it. Right. I, I think the most we've had spent during a disaster without a council having to have a meeting to approve it was a million bucks after a flood. But uh, after the fact, there's a resolution reaffirming everything that was done. There's full reporting. There's full disclosure. And there's not uh, anything that was wasteful or inappropriate. It was decisions that needed to be made to deal with the disaster. So they were. Economic development should be an easy one. A high score is the city's actively involved in economic development projects. You think you can dictate which way your future goes, and you've been active and involved in doing that. A low score is that city, and we've been to a number of these who say, that's none of our business. We're going to leave it entirely to the private sector. And believe it or not, there are still cities in Oklahoma who believe that way. And when we get to this question, they, they proudly write down a one because that's what they think the right answer should be. And that's their choice. Our response is, you get to decide. Is it important in Jinx America for you, the city, to be involved in economic development projects? And how active have you been and how successful have you been? So give a score on it. Number eight is planning and goal setting. We talked a little bit about that earlier, but how well as an organization do you map out your future? High score is we do it well, we have clear goals, we've done that uh, over a long period of time. A low score is we haven't gotten around to that yet. We were in a city and we asked this question and every member of the board said we've never done that. Not one. <coughs> and to me that's, that's an important part of the job, one of the more important parts. So give a score on how well you do planning and goal setting. Number nine, administration. This is not about Chris. This is about upper management of the city. How stable is the upper management of the city? As a board of directors for this organization, you should want stable management. We were in a city this size that had had eight city managers in two years. Of course, I get to leave town, so I asked, did you make eight bad hiring decisions in a row, or is it just a bad place to work and something else is wrong? And they agreed it was a bad place to work and something else was wrong. But think about that, eight in two years. Hard to be successful at anything. Our goal should be to have stable management over a long period of time and find a way to do that. And the way to do that is no different than with the workforce in general. Make it a good place to work, create a good environment for the management of the city, and that's not just the manager, that's everyone you deal with on a regular basis, and avoid being the revolving door city that has constant turnover. And number 10 is how well do we communicate as an organization? Are you getting the information you need to make decisions? A high score is you are. A low score is I wish I knew what was going on around here. And there are some cities that just have problems with communicating with each other. So we'll gather those. I think next, Aubrey, they probably have heard enough of us talking. Let's, I think we have about a five or six minute video of what I think is some of the best. Sure. I have a quick question for you as you talk about pushing decision-making to the lowest possible level, which is great, um, and the fact that our role is monitoring and evaluation. Have you developed metrics or data points that identify what should be measured in each of these areas? And I'll give you an example. As I, I met with our city manager when I first stepped on to talk about the finances, because we don't have the time as we get the reports on what goes in the consent agenda on all the financial activities 
uh, to scrutinize, oh, we're spending too much in this particular area. So what I, I came out of financial <coughs> services, and we use ratios. So if there's a dashboard of certain things that are measured, if you're talking about turnover, or we're talking about a, a typical turnover we see in municipalities, or the cost of turnover, um, so I'd be curious to know what you've developed I, in this I don't area. Think there's been a matrix developed for cities. I'm, I'm not aware of one. We've actually had this exact question come up someplace else, and, and it's a really interesting topic. On the financial side, we rely on Crawford and Associates. They're considered the financial uh, financial leading authority for cities in Oklahoma. If you go to their <coughs> websites, you'll find a lot of standardized approaches of how we measure finances, standardized reports. And we, uh, we use Crawford to prepare our financials for our annual audit, and they have uh, ratios, and they have a report they provide us every year that goes along with our, um, it's based on the audited numbers. They also do a performator for some cities. That's, yeah, that's what I'm referring okay, to. So you've used the performator, I think, for financial measurement. That is the standard in Oklahoma, and, and they do work for a large number of Oklahoma cities, some countries. Uh, all over the country. Uh, Frank Crawford been on the National GASB board. I believe was president of it. So on the financial side, it's easier. On the others, it's much harder. Uh, we only have those who have devoted the expertise to it. Chris, no, we don't. It's, uh, it'd be a great tool if we could do benchmarking. Um, back in the '80s, Sunnyvale, California, and Phoenix were known for benchmarking. Uh, uh, performance, but um, it's time consuming and like most folks, we're busy doing instead of busy reviewing. Chris, maybe during our planning session we might talk about just a couple KPIs that you, you already that you already have, but maybe put it in a dashboard for us to just be able to look at and say, okay, yeah, it's just a just a thought during the planning session. And we were talking uh, recently with um, a, a police chief and um, you know, it's even difficult to compare crime stats from the FBI because um, not every crime carries the same weight or the same magnitude and not every community uh, enforces laws equally and not everybody thinks that it's important to, uh, to keep good records. So. It's easier to have internal benchmarks and compare against how you're doing internally against a budget, for example. It would be nice if we had external benchmarks as well. We have a short video. It's five or six minutes. Uh, several years ago, one of the, I think one of the better things we were able to do with OMAG was uh, create a series of questions that were sent out with a bill or others from OMAG with a camera and a video person to ask some questions of public officials just like you of what what it's like to serve and so we captured some of that this is a condensed version of it I think we have hours and hours of it but this is five or six minutes of different officials around the state being asked about serving as a council member so I think it's helpful to hear from others and not just from us my memory city of Manchester I think chemistry is the most important it doesn't matter whether it's basketball or football, probably basketball the most, depending on what high people you're looking at. It only takes one or two that really are thinking more about themselves than the chemistry of the whole team to destroy anything. And you see it every day where teams that have much more talent get beat by teams with less talent because it's five against three and five against two instead of five against one. How do you accomplish that on the I think you strive for success and you explain to them that it isn't successful for two people or three people. It's only successful for five people. And if it's a failure, it's five or seven or nine, however many council members there are. I heard a speech some time ago that served me very well. The city council is the board of directors of a multi million dollar corporation. They have the interests of the community writ large as their first priority. And yes, they have elements of the community, but they have to view the, the operation as a business. Cost control, revenue generation, profit and loss uh, computations, and the direct impact of their opinions, be they political or pragmatic. They can't shy from those principles. My name is Omer Nicholson, and I'm a mayor of Bunker City, Oklahoma. It's important that our elected officials understand that they are a lawmaking governing body. We have a city 
city manager for the government, and the city manager and his department heads operate and run the city, not the commission. That's a little bit confusing at times for new commissioners. They do not tend to the daily responsibilities and tasks and duties as the city manager and his staff responsibility. Tyler Buttram, mayor of Vance, went from a time of where everybody thought about themselves and how they could benefit and just total chaos, off the cuff remarks, off the cuff motions, just, it's just, it was completely out of control, to now a lot more organized. They've traveled a lot to different cities to watch other mayors, how they run their meetings, watch other councils, how they conduct themselves, and that was pretty much the major of my training in this role. Did Booker get along with the city? Booker gets along very well now. It went from, like I said, a time of chaos to now a time of where everybody is there for the city, not for themselves. So you've seen a lot of growth, new retail development, residential development going on right now, and that has a lot to do with the council having a vision and everybody on the same page. We do have visions, and I know some people would laugh about that, but one of the things of training that we got from the training from OMAC is that, hey, our meetings aren't so bad, and so we have the same structure every time. We have the same expectations of our staff and of our commissioners, and I think all of us now are more respected of each other than we ever did. We discuss and we debate. There's not a lot of argument, and again, I think that's from being prepared. Find out the information you need beforehand. If you have a problem with something, generally, we work to build consensus, and so there will be times when we agree to disagree, but I would say arguing is at a minimum. Our commission does not discuss agenda items or argue with agenda items. We may discuss casually with agenda items, but we do not have arguments. That is one thing that I can take pride in in Ponca City, that we always work together. I don't know of any issue. I don't remember in 70 years of any issue that we have got into any strifes or embarrassing situations. We may discuss an item at length, lay out the pros and cons of the issue so that we know what we're voting on, but we've always been able to work together in unison as a governing body. A side comment, one time a citizen, our commission meetings are televised. One time a citizen had commented that they were going to quit watching our commission meetings because we never got in a fight. So I take pride in that comment. We put items on the racks. We don't bring items that are a mixed state of nature. They're policy setting. We provide a commission on a background to the city commission prior to that meeting. We may have had a work session on that particular item or that policy, so they have a clear understanding and they've been able to vet the background and the information and make a good decision. So when we get to the regular commission meeting, they have a commission on information and they feel very comfortable, I believe, in making the decision that they make. The other thing that I think is real important is time is valuable, and city commissioners and governing body members are volunteers. And as staff, we want to be respectful of that time. We do not want to bother them with trivial items. I worked 38 years in the corporate world, and I would say that our commission meetings and all of our meetings are held and conducted in a very dignified, courteous manner. We respect each other's comments. We give each person their time to hear their thoughts, pros or cons, and we lay those thoughts out on the table. We massage those ideas and try to come to a general consensus that everybody can live with. We need to have some of the worst of the evil in the city of Lowell. What was that like? They were the worst. You can sum up. They are absolutely the worst. It was agendas for two people, and those two people would garner as many negative people as they could to come to meetings to make it a social platform for them. And in that time, not one bit of progress happened in those meetings. I believe it's imperative that if you want quality people to continue to be council members, it needs to be an experience that they can enjoy that's not a burden on them. Our council respects each other. It's one of the first things that we document through a variety of OMAG and OML training, and one of the things that spoke to me the loudest was that with each 
vote, you have to re respect the vote of your contemporary, and you have to respect the vote of those who made decisions before you were elected, period. In other words, unless you're a part of the decision, you don't know how it came about. I'm very proud of our commission's ability to cooperate with each other. We have sometimes emotion that we enter into it, and I'm no stranger to that. Sometimes I'm the instigator, and, and sometimes it serves me well, and often it doesn't. And I try to remind myself, and, and my commissioners who also remind me, that we have to respect their chances, and, and they've served us well. My memory, city of Manton. I think chemistry is the most degree run. I, I would point out one thing. You saw uh, on the on the video a uh, young mayor in Manford, Tyler. He's he's uh, just resigned recently because of work commitments, uh, and he mentioned going to a lot of cities to learn how to be mayor. One of the places he came was here, and uh, most of you probably didn't know it. He sat in the back of the room, and uh, it may have been before most of you, but uh, it was on the list of places he should go to uh, see how cities do things right. I'm always amazed we go some places and, and uh, the city doesn't recognize that they've been successful. You guys have been tremendously successful over a long period of time. You really have. You are one of the model cities. Bill mentioned that we use you as an example uh, around the state, and we have. I've made the comment numerous times. I wish someone would make a short movie about the history of Jinx because it would be a fascinating story for the rest of the state to understand what is possible. If you go back 30 years, what did Jinx look like? 5,000 population? I looked at an audit from 10 years ago, and it's amazing where you are from 10 years ago. But wouldn't it be a fascinating history, and especially considering you're on the verge of an outlet mall that's gonna change the world? I mean, you're, you're a mayor at a great time, aren't you? Uh, it really is. Doesn't feel like it sometimes. <laughs> uh, yes, it's just difficult, isn't it? I mean, uh... Uh, well, you know how many other cities in Oklahoma are getting an outlet mall in the next couple of years? Uh, that would be none other than this one. Uh, so. Uh, the rest of the presentation has some ideas on how you can uh, improve in each of the categories. You've gotten a written copy, so I'm not going to go through all of those. I, I would encourage you to look at it. There are some, some ideas. I don't know if you have a city council handbook. Do you? <laughs> I, I would encourage you over time. That's Okay. I, I would encourage you over time to have a, a very good city council handbook that will capture what you do and how you do it and why you do it so that those who come after you will, will know how you got to this point and sustain it. The worst thing that can happen to you as a group is for a future group to come along and dismantle the progress of Jinx, to blow all the money, to destroy the economic development focus, and to turn it into what uh, about 400 other cities are in Oklahoma because you are not what those other cities are. You are one of the examples of, of the way things should be done. So, uh, questions? I think there are a couple topics we probably didn't deal with as much as we should because we don't know all the answers. How we deal with the public is an extremely difficult topic. I've suggested that the city attorney's group have a, a topic to deal with that because it is difficult every place right now. Oklahoma City area is, uh, most of their suburbs are having litigation over almost every land use decision. And when we think about why that's happening is because there's this fight between my right to use my property as I want to and, and my financial interests versus the public interest. And that's just going on. It's much more contentious Oklahoma City area than here. It's coming here because we're seeing it over and over. And the public's role in that is difficult. Ten years ago, we would have thought uh, we saw the worst of that in, in all of the public outrage over apartment complexes and, and those type things. We're now seeing it over normal residential subdivisions. Never thought we would see that, but uh, we're seeing that, protest over residential subdivisions that meet all zoning requirements. So it's just a different environment than we're used to, which makes your job much more difficult. 
just does. So be glad to try to answer any questions. I encourage you to look over the rest of it. Any topic you want me to cover that we haven't. Mr. Brown. Public comments. Oh, good. This is one where yeah. Bill and I have a little bit of disagreement. What's the public's role in having uh, what I call open mic night? I don't know if you have public comments on your agenda, but I've been an advocate for the position that, uh, and some of that goes back to my background. My first experience in dealing with the city was dealing with allegations of open meeting violations. I am very restrictive. We're going to have strict compliance. I became convinced early in my career that open mic night, public comments, invites violations of the Open Meeting Act. It is not required by the Com Open Meeting Act. And I have not yet seen a situation in which public comments <coughs> leads to better government and better decision making. About half of our cities around the state allow public comments at, at, uh, as an agenda topic that is an open-ended, say what you want to say, open mic night. About half cities do that, about half do not. It's up to you as an organization of how you want to do it, and, and I'm not here to say if you have it, you should get rid of it. I'm here to say that uh, I don't represent any city that has it, and I am aware of at least a city manager or two who have said, I won't work in a city that has it because they've seen the, the dark side of it. Robert, have we, in your memory, have we always had uh, public comments? Um, and you've been here the longest, I would think. Yeah. It's not required. I don't want to say that from your pulse is always on, Kevin. Just had it the whole time. Yeah. Uh, I, I've been here seven years and we've always had it. I can agree with you. I mean, we had public, com how much, what do you, what, how often do you think the public takes us up on it, Donna? And Charlotte's here all the time. I mean, if we could keep Charlotte quiet, we probably wouldn't need public <laughs> Um you think yeah. it's pretty consistent? At the beginning of the meeting? Probably, yeah. Well, we had a gentleman come up and just kind of read a speech about how we're either incompetent or corrupt. But, right. um, but it wasn't starting an agenda No, of course not. So, yeah. So, But those, the, to your point, it can turn into, you know, I call it a dumpster fire. But I also, I think as a group and the council, we can decide this for our future. But uh, I think if there's anything... I could do better is I've gone probably overboard and overreacted to the call for transparency. And I've had a sitting city councilor, which I tend to want to respect the folks up here more than those in the audience. And I've let them ramble for 17 and 20 minutes and all they do is disparage us. So I mean, you guys as a collective group think we need to tighten the reins on public comment to three minutes. We can do that because so far, I've, I'm of the opinion that the moment you choose to sit here is it's death by a million s slow stabs, and that's just what our job is, is to eat the crap sandwich. But if you guys disagree, we can change it. So relative to the violation of the open meetings, we don't generally, and we make a very clear point to not have dialogue. Correct. They just can say whatever they want, rant or, or praise. I mean, we've had both. But, next. Right, but we don't. We do a really pretty good job of not engaging. So to me, that wouldn't necessarily make for an open. I mean, if someone came up and and made a public comment about something that was going to come on the agenda, and we did not engage, is that still an open meetings uh, by, here's violation? Here. Someone comes before you and says, uh, "Council, I, I uh, drive through the intersection of Main and Broadway every day. It's uh, is a two-way stop. It should be four-way." It's a dangerous intersection, and the mayor turns to the manager and says, boy, I agree, I drive through that too. Can you take care of that? Yeah, it's a dialogue. Yeah. And, and you've never given no notice to the public of what topic you were going to talk about. You mm -hmm. made a sure. decision about I think we've ever done something that. of an importance. You didn't mean to. I think we have we've may have towed the line once or twice, but we, we, do, we allow residents to come, and they'll hand out. Pat, We had a lady come last week and handed out packets of information but i think for the most part we all know that we can we we're on the receiving end of but we don't typically talk back and the most i think might have say is thank you for bringing that to our attention and somebody will follow up with you it's a tough issue yeah so you get rid of it because you can be criticized for 
Yeah, so I don't see it. Like, yeah. like three minute limitation. I know that those cities that don't have it, start that. Have it. Start there. Uh, What's that? Like they, yeah. Nor do we want to, but I mean, I think people, if they want to come and criticize our staff, uh, giving them more than three minutes to do it is isn't my responsibility. Um, nor should we have to. Yeah. Or I could just. Sometimes I feel like just doing a Mark Wayne Mullen and standing up and beating the crap out of him, to be honest with you. But. I've always advocated there should be a trap door at the podium. And yeah. sure. So, uh, yeah. Mr. Mayor, I appreciate the very Bill neutral the way in which our counselor has framed the question. Wait a minute, you're the past. I do not agree with our esteemed counselor here. <laughs> And he knows I don't, and so he uses that kind of language to poke me till I'll stand up here. <laughs> Allowing the public to petition the government is not prohibited by the Constitution of the State of Oklahoma or any law. Isn't that correct, Counselor? That's right. Thank you. And since you have Who's Stockholm you? Syndrome, because you went to all these terrible meetings that you were at for all these years, now you want to put the saran wrap on uh, the public and not let them come and talk to their elected officials. The key to it, and by the way, you are not prohibited from talking to the public when you sit in that chair. The only way you will violate the open meeting law is if you take an action, which he, in a very polished way, slipped in there at the end. But here's what often happens. Folks around the horseshoe have been told that you're at an auction. If you move, you have bought something. <laughs> or they've been told you're at an Amway presentation. If you wiggle, you have a big <laughs> box of soap you're taking home with. You are not prohibited from talking to people at this podium. You are prohibited from taking an action that's not on the agenda. And if you want to diffuse things in the community, you might let them come and tell you what their concern is. Now, because I'm a very fair person, <coughs> most of the time their concerns are going to be administrative in nature. And it's very easy to say, we'll have our manager look into that, and he'll say, I'll have my staff look into that. Whether or not we need a stop sign at 3rd and Hoppy Toad Road or not, we'll have the police chief look at that. But you, you are not prohibited from having the public be able to address you. You're not prohibited from talking to them when they address you. If you sit up there like a bunch of Easter Island stone statues, all you do is make them matter because they don't know how government works. They never got taught that in school. They come up here because something's got a burr under them bad enough to get them up here because most people probably don't think, hey, Martha, it's Monday. Let's go to the city council meeting. Bill, our current process, I think, works. So. But, uh, because but to the your counselor point. <laughs> takes me all around the state and does this to me every place we go. But to your point, I've, we've, I, we maybe, I don't know how many as individuals, we've taken a few beatings for, from very, very smart people that come here and don't know what, what's going on here. And they say, they just stood there and stared at me and didn't say a damn thing. So, um, I, you know, when, when I, the mayor before me and the mayor before me used to say it's public comment time, everybody come on up. And uh, I think I've made it, try to do it deliberately, explain what public comment is. And I don't know, I think we're doing it well. I think if we could do anything better as a group, we just need to kind of limit it to a few minutes. Mayor, you, you, you have gotta, the ultimate uh, control because you run the gavel. Yeah. Oh, the gavel. I forgot about that. You've got the gavel. And I will tell you that one of the people you saw in the video, uh, of course, it's a smaller place and it's a different setting, but um, if he saw someone in the audience, he would go and uh, shake their hand, introduce himself, and ask them uh, why they were here. And most of the time, they never stood up at the podium because it was explained to them that um, the city manager is the one that can help you with the stop sign at 3rd and Hoppy Toad Road. So. Now you've heard both sides, one more neutrally presented. <laughs> Any other questions or topics? Uh, just a quick comment, an observation, where you were talking about the litigious nature of what's happening in Oklahoma City, and, and we are seeing some of it come out here, and it kind of funnels into this last discussion. 
um, I don't know where you gentlemen graduated from, but we've got the Oklahoma uh, Intercollegiate Legislature. This would be a good topic to take to OSU, OUTU, and to put together a series of informational videos that could go out to the public on public television or on cable that says, hey, this is how a city operates. I know that our mayor has done an excellent job in promoting leadership janks and those that have gotten very vocal about their opinions. And we say, you've got opinions, now let's get information in your hands so you'll understand how decisions are made. And I think if we, if good, good decisions come from good information, if we can get good information out of the public, uh, maybe that's something you guys could de to develop, just a suggestion. No, I think that's a good idea. And one of our problems is there's very little education that's been provided on civics and how government works and, and really what your job is and how you're supposed to do it. And, and all of those land use issues are, are at the brunt of that. So we're just seeing it over and over. Yeah, civics today is what we can do on social media and how many people we can get stirred up. I'm being facetious, of course. Yeah. Anything else, Chris? Anything else you can think of? Any, any uh, other topics you want Bill and I to disagree about? <laughs> I just want to consider future curriculum that would be help, helpful to elected leaders. It's maybe um, a protocol and as it relates to social media. Um, okay. How should, what are the expectations? What's the safe place to be? And, you know, I see, I see big, big, Different examples, I see Phil Lakin, who jumps on board every platform once a week and and uh, seems to be praised for it. Most of it is related to, you know, roads. Um, but wow. I think he does an excellent job of somehow avoiding the the onslaught of criticism because he's simply telling you what I agree is when, when things are terrible, I think you should tell people that they're terrible. Yeah, yeah this road's terrible, and it's not going to get fixed for a while, and we just all have to agree that that's the way it is. But I think social media is a is that some of us could get to go to National League of Cities and they do, uh, they have a, a one hour session on uh, social media policy, but not everybody gets to go. And um, but social media is our big thing. I mean, I had a lady come up to me um, two nights ago at our public safety conference and everybody in the room knows her. And she said, you're, you're terrible at social media. And she said, I just came from a city in Ohio and that mayor does this, 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 and this. So I went home and found out this city's at 100,000 people. The mayor's full-time. She gets paid. That's her only dang job. And, uh, you know, but people don't realize how unfair it is. Uh, right. You know, Different form of we work for a yeah. living. And there's times where we struggle to get here uh, for council meetings on time. On time. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Some but, cities do it very well. Aubrey, what, in Oklahoma, Stillwater, still one of the best at social media. Nationally. Uh, what's another? Yeah. They do a pretty good job of, on their city I, I think if the city the staff can handle communicate, and that was the lowest score I gave was communication. Yeah. And why? Because I get my ass kicked all the time from everybody that says, you're not doing enough. And I'm thinking, I can't be up until midnight answering questions. But, um, and some counselors just totally avoid it. But I think that'd be a good, a good place to educate us and, and then take that education to the communications directors and city managers across the state and say, look, here's an example of getting out in front of the problem. Like you said, sir, before the council meetings, in the old days when everybody liked us, we used to come early and shake hands and talk to people, and now we're slipping in the back door at 6 o'clock because we want to avoid the same people who call, keep calling the news stations to come out and ask us silly questions. So, yeah, but I think your, your point's a really good one. Shake a hand, say hello while you're here and you solve a lot of problems that won't make it to that public comment. But we need help navigating social media yeah. because some of us want to lash out and some of us, yeah, the hardest part about being the mayor, the vice mayor, any one of us is biting our tongues. Yeah. Yeah, yeah some people seem to lose all sense of respect <laughs> or decorum when they're talking to appointed or elected officials. And you folks are neighbors. You live here. They're, you're serving and that service doesn't come with wealth and abuse. And I, uh, I've written down your, your, your suggestions and your suggestions. They're very good. You know, uh, OMAC does this training because um, we don't like paying 
different claims, and we think the best-run cities and towns have fewer claims, and the claims that they do have cost less money to resolve. And the character and the direction and the allocation of resources ultimately is around this horseshoe. Because what you all are manifests itself in what your city manager is, which manifests itself in what his team is. And so there's root cause of loss and there's proximate cause of loss. You guys are the root cause, not the proximate cause. If you guys are healthy, the organization will be healthy. If you guys are dysfunctional, then we'll pay a lot more claims because the organization will be dysfunctional. Thank you for having us out and being generous with the time and engaging with us. And Chris, thanks for having us out. We appreciate that. And and um, and to your question, uh, we're Oklahoma State graduates. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks, Mayor. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. The time is uh, 1.25 and we are adjourned.